So again, uh, thank you everybody for joining us um, for this uh, edition of Tenant Talk Live. Uh, just a reminder again that this session is being recorded um, and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel later this week. Uh, my name is Sydney Betancourt. I also go by Sid for short, and I'm a housing advocacy organizer with the coalition. Uh, and I just want to start off by wishing everybody a happy February and a happy Black History Month. I think it's kind of important to, you know, acknowledge the fact that we can't really be having this conversations that we're having today without acknowledging that, you know, there is like a lot of hard work by Black activists, not just in the past, but currently that are really important to the housing movement right now. And that there is a lot of racist history and housing policy, which has displaced many Black communities. So and we hope that through our work um, in LIHC can create racially and socially, socially <laughs> equitable public policy. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes my list just comes through, it's okay. <laughs> and just a few reminders in terms of logistics. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A feature. You'll notice that there's a separate chat and Q&A feature um, down below. So just make sure that you drop them in the Q&A feature. Um, but please feel free to use the chat to share your thoughts. I will be sending up a follow-up email either later this week or early next week with information on the chat, um, a video recording, and any resources that are shared throughout the call today. Um, so that will be available to everybody um, who signed up. And then most importantly, to begin with today's um, topic, we'll be covering two different pieces of legislation, one of which being is Pets Belong with Family Act and the Electrical Vehicles for All Act. And then we'll be taking um, any questions that you might have and feedback for um, the legislation that we'll present to you a little bit later. But before I introduce um, one of our familiar panelists for this evening, I do want to provide some NLHC updates. Um, this is going to take a minute, so I apologize, but these are really important um, updates that everybody needs to know. So just bear with me, and if you have any questions, I will be providing um, the email address for the folks that you can ask the questions to. However, a lot of them are actually on the call right now, so you can feel free to ask them as well. But I'll go ahead and get started with the first update, which is probably like the biggest thing that you're probably all wondering about, which is the Build Back Better Act. Um, it is a risk of elimination as Congress and the White House negotiate kind of like a slimmed down version of the bill um, in November 2021, which feels like so long ago now, <laughs> the House of Representatives passed um, a version of the bill that included some of our housed um, campaign top priorities, which includes uh, 25 billion to expand housing vouchers to an additional 300,000 low income households and 65 billion to preserve public housing and improve living conditions for the nation's more than 2 million public housing residents and 15 billion for the National Housing Trust Fund to build and maintain and operate an estimated 150,000 new units of deeply affordable accessible housing. And if these um, provisions are enacted, it would be one of the largest single investments in quality, affordable and accessible housing um, for the lowest income um, households in history. And you know, the build was stalled by Senator Manchin um, when he announced in December, 2021 that he would not support the package as it is currently written. And to advance the bill, congressional leaders are using a process called budget reconciliation, which basically means that Congress can pass um, this package without using 60 votes. They can just use a simple majority in the Senate, um, but that would require every Democrat. And so therefore they would require Senator Manchin. Um, and this past weekend, Senator Manchin said that um, the committees should kind of work on the bill themselves, but that would be nearly impossible. And it almost indicates that he wants to slow down the passing of the bill. And so the, the slower the process takes, the more unlikely it is that the bill will pass. Um, so progressives are kind of pushing for a hard deadline of March 1st, um, right in time for the President's State of the Union. And um, the House Democrats do remain very optimistic, but there doesn't seem to be a clear vision of what the bill will look like. So this is a very, very critical time for you all to be reaching out to your members of Congress. We do know that whatever is going to pass is gonna be scaled back. So we wanna make sure that those housing provisions make it into 
um, build back better or whatever um, the package ends up being called. Um, we just wanna make sure that any economic recovery package has those provisions in them. And then in addition to Build Back Better, negotiations on the spending bill for 2022 um, continue. And they follow um, like a months long stalemate between Democratic and Republican legislators who disagreed on overall funding numbers for the US Department of Defense and other programs on whether to maintain certain policy provisions, mainly um, domestic um, programs included in the previous year's spending bill. And so as a result of this stalemate, Congress has enacted a series of continuing resolutions, also known as CRs, which keep the uh, federal government funded. The current CR that has been passed is going to be expiring on February 18th, which is, I think, next Friday? I don't know. Yeah, next Friday. So at that point, Congress will need to pass um, an FY or a fiscal year 2022 spending bill or enact another CR. Otherwise, the government will face a shutdown. And so the FY 2022 spending bill presents Congress with an opportunity to move the nation towards universal, stable and affordable homes for all by making significant investments in affordable housing, including expanding the Housing Choice Vouchers Program to an additional 120, 125,000 households with low incomes. The House Spending Bill would provide HUD programs with almost 7 billion more than was provided in the FY21 and guarantee significant funding increases for all HUD programs, uh, including an expansion of rental assistance through tenant-based rental assistance program, and then again, an additional 125,000 125, households. Um, but the Senate proposal, um, however, would provide HUD with over 1 billion less than the House proposal would. And it wouldn't include that expansion of the rental assistance. And so now again, it's a critical time for advocates to continue to urge Congress members to enact a final spending bill that provides the most possible funding to affordable housing and community development programs and include the house proposal to expand the rental assistance as well. Um, earlier today during our house call, Sarah Sadian uh, mentioned that the house released a version of a continuing resolution to be passed after this one expires on February 18th. Um, and they, it, sees, it seems like they wanna bring down the funding level of domestic funding and um, Republicans are really for wanting a full year CR because that would mean that it would be a cut again to certain programs. Um, but these programs are like a lot of the HUD programs that people need funding for every year. And that's why we really wanna make sure that a CR doesn't pass again. We wanna make sure that we are funding um, like a fiscal year 2022 bill. Um, and again, I think Courtney just put that in the chat if you wanna urge your members. Um, to make sure that they support the expansion of rental assistance through the FY 2022 budget. And if you have any questions too, I wouldn't say I'm like the expert on all things policy, but I do know somebody who is, and that is our very own Kim Johnson. Um, so I will be dropping, or Courtney will be dropping her email in the um, chat. Um, and she will also be joining us very soon, but really briefly, I just wanna go over some ERA related updates. So in the past month, we have um, released two reports. One of the reports is called the Tenant Protections and Emergency Rental Assistance during uh, and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was written by some of the lovely folks on our policy and erase teams. And it goes over current tenant protections and it discusses opportunities for strengthening and expanding set protections. And it covers protections from across the country. Um, if you have any questions regarding um, tenant protection resources or the report itself, you can contact Jade Vasquez at um, jvasquez at nohc.org. And then um, we also had another amazing report by our research team called ERA Among Indigenous Tribes, Findings Among Tribal Grantees. And I wanna shout out um, NLHC's very own Nitu has been working on this report very closely for a few months now. And if you have any questions about that report itself, you can also email her at nair, so n-n-a-i-r at nlhc.org. I need a quick water break. I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> I told you I was gonna be a lot of information, but it's a lot of good information. 
So in terms of like ERA spending, um, the Department of Treasury hasn't released any new information yet, um, but we are expecting to see new data soon. But we do know that the next reallocation of emergency rental assistance funds is gonna happen next month or so. And with the current um, allocations of emergency rental assistance, we have two different buckets of funding. So the first bucket of funding, we've seen that um, about 62% of that funding has been spent, which kind of approximates to $15.5 billion. And the second allocation of that is about 17.7%, which is about $3.8 billion. Um, one of the biggest things um, that our um, ERA team wanted me to share with you all is that a lot of the fast spending programs are beginning to shut down. So um, if they're not shutting down, you'll see that some of them are gonna be on hold while they wait to see if they get more money or not. Um, some of these programs um, you'll see are in Alaska, DC, Illinois, Texas, Minnesota, and they can be on hold while they wait for um, more money to come in or if they're waiting to um, kind of figure out what happens um, in their state next. Um, and there's other ones that have been completely closed. So if you're from Chicago or Philly or Austin, you'll see that the program has completely closed itself. But our research team is working very diligently to make sure that um, the status of these programs are updated on our website all the time. So you can see that on our dashboard. Um, we know, for example, that in Oregon, it was on hold for December, but then again in early January, it was open again. So just make sure that you're checking it frequently to see um, if that's a possibility for your jurisdiction. And again, um, NLHC continues to track a lot of these ERA changes and spending in real time. But if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to our research team at research at nlhc.org. Um, and I think we might have some folks on the line um, from our eRACE team that might be able to answer your questions, but if not, again, you can always email them at the eResearch email. So that was all of our NLHC updates. Again, I know that was kind of a lot, but really important stuff for you to know. A lot of advocacy opportunities right now, so I hope you'll take advantage of that. Um, but I would now like to welcome our very own Kim Johnson, who is a senior pol policy analyst with the coalition. Um, many of you might have seen her on other calls, um, but she always has really good policy updates. And today she will be providing an overview on two pieces of legislation, again, known as the Pets Belong With Families Act and Electric Vehicles for All Act. Um, and with that, I'll let Kim take it away. Thanks so much, Sid, and hi, everyone. Um, happy, as always, to be here with you all. Like Sid said, I'm Kim Johnson. I'm a senior policy analyst here at NLIHC. And before jumping into um, the two policies that Sid mentioned that we're hoping for your feedback on, um, I did just want to respond to a couple of things that I saw pop up in the chat as Sid was talking about a lot of NLIHC's um, ongoing work and the legislative updates that she just provided. Um, so I saw a comment from um, Bill Higgins, good to see you Bill, glad you could make it, um, about maybe getting someone like Susan Collins to vote yes on the Build Back Better Act. Um, we've also thought about, you know, is there any chance that we can get a more moderate Republican to flip sides and vote in favor of the Build Back Better Act? Um, you know, like uh, Senator Portman in Ohio, who has supported bipartisan provisions before, um, especially related to housing, um, and who is not seeking re-election next year. So in theory, would be a good candidate to um, basically court to vote in favor of that bill. Um, unfortunately, one of the things with Republicans is that they are very, very good at sticking together and sticking to their talking points and sticking to their political positions. Um, so unfortunately, even though I'm sure that there are provisions within Build Back Better that there would garner some Republican support, um, I don't foresee any Republicans flipping to vote in favor of the bill, even those who are more moderately inclined and who have been um, champions for affordable housing in the past, like Senator Collins or um, Senator Portman. Um, so I don't know that um, we are going to see a path forward to enactment through courting Republicans to vote yes. Um, and I also did see a comment in the chat from Karen about um, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, um, which for years um, in LIHC 
has been pushing to make the needed reforms necessary to ensure that that program works for the lowest income people. Because as it currently stands, um, it's exactly what Karen is saying in the chat. It is not a program that is geared to work for the lowest income people. Um, it, it's geared to, you know, address um, the need, housing needs of people at, you know, 80% of AMI, 100% of AMI pretty well, um, but it is not going to um, address the needs of the lowest income folks. And so we've been working to try to make needed reforms to that program so it does work for um, the lowest income people. And we have um, a, a new member of our research team, um, Betty Ramirez, who is also working to study um, housing affordability in LIHTC and how it phases out and the impact of that on low income um, tenants. Um, so I just that all that is to say, um, Karen, absolutely, we hear you and um, we're going to continue doing that advocacy to make sure that that's a program that is going to serve um, the, the people that we're here to serve. Um, and, you know, I think that there's something uh, satisfying too, like you're not imagining any of this, you know, uh, it, it, you, you feel that way because it is that way. It's not a program that's um, geared to help people who need housing assistance the most. Um, and so we're um, continuing, we're, we're going to continue to push to make those changes. Um, and thank you so much, Karen, for bringing that up. And thank you to Bill Higgins for um, raising the question of whether or not um, uh, uh, any Republicans might be, might come on board for Build Back Better. Um, really appreciate those thoughtful comments from folks. Um, yeah, LIHTC is um, biased and unfair. Yeah, it's not it, it's not a program that 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 helps people who need it the most. Um, absolutely. Um, so I do want to get into kind of the meat of our discussion. Um, and first, we're going to provide just a little bit of background. So um, a couple offices have reached out to um, the National Low Income Housing Coalition to see if we will endorse bills that are geared towards residents of um, public housing and federally assisted housing. And before we sign on to bills that will impact the lives of assisted tenants, we wanna make sure that those bills are um, helping assisted ten tenants and that they have the approval uh, of tenants. And so we wanted to um, bring some of these bills to your attention to get your feedback, your thoughts about whether or not NLIHC should support these bills or if they should maybe go back to the drawing board and um, get a little bit more, more feedback before um, bring, being uh, passed into law. And so the first is the Pets Belong with Families Act, which was introduced in the House. Um, and to make it kind of short and sweet, the bill would essentially ban any um, breed specific bans uh, uh, on certain pets in public housing. So for example, it would ban um, public housing agencies from saying no tenants um, can live here if they have a pit bull or something like that. Um, and instead it says that um, PHAs need to take into consideration um, you know, whether or not a specific dog or specific pet is dangerous as opposed to making any kind of general breed specific bans. Um, and so that is the first bill that we wanted to discuss and hear your feedback on. Um, it's, a, it's a, you know, kind of a short and sweet bill, if you will. That's um, basically what it does. Um, but yeah, really interested in hearing your thoughts. And I see that we have a hand up from Esther. Um, I don't think I can control on mute, but I'm sure that's it. Can. Yes, let me. <laughs> I think I can get it to work now, Esther. If you want to yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, hi everybody. Hi. I'm kind of disappointed that that's what this bill is about. I was hoping that this was going to be a little bit more um, broader, so that I mean. I don't I don't understand why animal activists don't get involved more with this in this conversation because you know in my, in many cities renters are the majority of the residents and if they have pets they can't find a place to live and so I think that it's discriminatory because we all know that it's illegal to discriminate against people that have kids for rentals but if you have a pet you know, they can get away with it and they charge huge deposits and pet rent on top of it now. So I was hoping that this bill would be a little bit more geared towards that because I kind of feel like 
you know, if you have a rent, uh, a landlord or, or a property owner that ha owns X amount of units, that a portion of them should be designated for people with pets. And I don't, I, I mean, to talk about breed specific, how many rentals do we all, do we even have that take them in the first place to go after this angle as opposed to something that would incorporate many more people? Does that make sense? That absolutely makes sense. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point, Esther. Um, like, like I said, this isn't a bill that NLA just helped draft. It was just something that folks reached out to us to endorse. And I agree that I think it could do a lot more. Um, and it doesn't really lay out how PHAs would make a determination about whether or not a pet is right? right? Um, that it's, it's, it's very broad um, without giving a lot of specifics um, how the bill would be presented. But getting into the conversation, I think now that the door is being opened up, I, I would hope that someone is going to take this and, and run with it rather than just table it. Because I will tell you that I, I work on a lot of these issues. I have, um, I've pressured a couple of the local homeless shelters to add kennels to their shelters because we have people that are homeless that refuse to go to shelters because they won't part with their animals. And so if we want to prevent homelessness, we have to find a way to get people that are renting that essentially many are going to be renters forever to be able to not have to choose between having housing or keeping their pets. So hopefully whoever's bringing this up will take it and not let it, you know, die or will expand on it so that it covers a little bit. I mean, like I said, to talk about this when it comes to breed specific, I mean, that conversation's had with people that own dogs in their own home because they're asked to carry higher insurance and cover their pet. But for renters, this is kind of like almost a silly conversation to have if we're not working on trying to get them some way that they can keep their pets. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you, Esther. There's a lot of good comments in the chat too, Kim. I don't know if you looked up it, but... Yeah, I've been um, reading through those comments as well, and I did see a question from Sherry about what the odds are of that bill getting passed. Um, that's the question. Uh, I've seen those two, um, and I, I don't think that the chances of you know this bill being passed as a standalone bill are very high. But I could see it passing sometimes in Congress when there's a bill that's moving, like say bill or something like that, um, it, uh, other bills get tacked onto it and pass along with that kind of like what's called a moving vehicle, that, uh, that bill that's already looks like it's going to pass. Um, so it could, I could see it getting tacked onto a bill in that way, um, but not necessarily passing uh, as a standalone measure, if that makes sense. And I see some kind of Chat. Um, is Esther, I completely Wait, agree with hold. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to make sure, Esther, if you wanted to um, mute yourself really quickly. That way there's no static in the background because we're oh, having- Oh, sorry. I thought I had- No, it's okay. I was actually it's writing okay. in the chat. I, I think somebody asked a question there that misunderstood what I said. What I said is that the majority of residents in many cities are renters not that majority of renters have pets. So I just was clarifying that in the chat. I think that was the static you were hearing, sorry. No worries, thank you. <laughs> just <the> virtual world problems. <laughs> Go ahead, Kim, I know you were in the middle of saying something. No, not at all. Um, uh, I think there are a lot of really um, important questions that are being posed in the chat. Um, so uh, I see two, um, uh, a comment from Chris saying many low income units don't allow pets. Um, senior housing is a rare exception. Um, that, that's another important point as well, Chris. Thank you for raising that. Um, so senior housing and housing for people with disabilities would not be impacted by this bill. And, um, you know, any kind of um, pet that's a service animal, um, that is a different kind of beast that go, goes through um, the American with Disabilities Act. And so, you know, any service animals would still, you know, not be impacted by this bill. Um, folks with a service animal would still be able to um, keep their service animal. 
Um, uh, Danielle also notes that um, it's not the dog that's the problem, it's the behavior of the owners um, that train dogs to attack. Um, kids who are, you know, running around in apartment complexes um, might be intimidated by a, a vicious or violent pet. Um, absolutely, uh, we know that, you know, breeds are not necessarily dangerous. Um, it's how somebody raises a dog um, or trains them. And so I think that that's what that bill, kind of, this bill is trying to do. Um, it is, is to allow for that kind of um, variation in how a pet is brought up and bring into kind of um, bring into account um, individualized um, review of a potential uh, uh, of a pet that's being considered. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think it provides very much information about how that process would go. Um, to to you know um, part of what Esther was saying too. There's just like not. There could be a, a lot more meat to the bill than it currently exists. Um, I did, I, I guess this kind of goes along the lines of adding more meat to the text, but <laughs> I did have some questions come in like through registration as well that I wanted to ask um, for folks. Um, I guess the first one would be, would the PHAs um, be vetting the dogs or would there be like a mandatory obedience class for the dogs? I feel like you kind of touched on that already, but um, yeah. one it's last part of that question is also um, if it would be possible to expand it to other species such as reptiles um, like turtles. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that is a great question. So um, first, it would be up to the discretion of the PHA. Um, there wouldn't be any kind of mandatory obedience class or anything like that. And second, um, when it comes to um, pets more broadly, that would, um, that, that would, uh, uh, it, it's not just dogs, it would be any kind of, any kind of um, potentially quote unquote dangerous pet that would be um, evaluated um, more on an individual basis as opposed to based on uh, a specific breed. Thank you. Um, and you said it was the local housing authority that would make up those rules, correct? Yes, it would be the PHA who ultimately has um, discretion about whether or not um, uh, that, that specific pet would be um, admitted. I think that was that was like a three part question, but it came from the same person. So I just wanted to make sure that I answered that. Um, cool. And then I think if there's any other questions. Um, I do see a question. I, I, that, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, I was just saying, I do see a question from Danielle about how can they assure responsible rearing and hold the owners accountable? Um, that is a great question. Um, and uh, uh, again, the bill doesn't really go into a lot of specifics or details about how this provision would be implemented. Um, so to me, I think what a, a lot of what I'm hearing and considering is that one, there needs to be a little bit more substance and two, there needs to be um, greater details given to accountability measures um, and, and how this bill specifically would be implemented. And then, and I also, Sherry, oh yeah, I was gonna say Sherry um, dropped two questions in the Q&A just asking um, if there's like a way that we can fight that because um, our housing authority won't allow turtles. Oh, interesting. Um, that's that is really interesting. Um, right now, I, I don't know. Um, my my best advice would be to maybe get into contact with um, a, a, a housing lawyer. Um, I think that it would vary from PHA to PHA how you would go about fighting that. Um, if it's something like an emotional support animal, um, I think that that would run up against um, the American with Americans with Disability Act, um, and PHAs have to make those accommodations for um, people who have um, those support animals. So that would be something I think that would be um, more uh, geared towards a, a housing lawyer. Um, And then I think there was another, um, oh, I just lost it, but I know that um, Deborah, oh no, it was um, Avis who asked, um, what is NLHC doing to advocate within this program for prospective renters um, that have medical disabilities such as a diabetic? And I think this kind of 
<laughs> it's a bit of a tangent away from like the pets, but I think it's one important one to acknowledge too. Yeah, it is definitely an important question to acknowledge. Um, so Avis, thank you so much for asking because that is a very, very important question. Um, we are talking to HUD about, you know, raising their um, uh, their, their um, minimum rent or their minimum rent, no, sorry, um, their uh, uh, rent standards so that um, it better reflects the actual cost of rent. Um, part of the issue with the voucher program that we know is going on is that people cannot find a place to um, rent because the voucher does not go high enough to cover the cost of rent. Um, and so we are advocating with HUD to make those changes so that people can actually take up um, the, the and use vouchers when they receive them. And then, um, you know, Deborah and Danielle just stating that they are going to be having a lot of conversation about fees in 2022. Um, Mike D saying the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I thought it was funny. I just wanted to highlight that really quickly <laughs> as a uplifter. Um, Danielle also mentioned that this um, bill sounds very open ended. Um, and I, I would agree. I think there's definitely room to go back to um, the drawing board and think of like additional things that we might be able to add. Um, Karen notes that she thinks it's criminal to charge any kind of pet fees to disabled folks who um, have certified service animals. Um, and then I think Molly had a question about there being a requirement um, from for inculation and vaccines for pets. Um, that bill does or this bill does not address any kind of um, uh, vaccination or inoculation requirements. Um, I know that those requirements also vary from city to city. Um, so for example, I have two cats who have to get their yearly shots and they have to have proof of their vaccinations. Um, but the, the bill does not address um, anything related to inoculations or vaccines um, currently. And then um, I know we have like a few questions um, that are still coming up right now, but I know you had another piece of legislation that you wanted to cover too, so I wanted to make time for that. Um, feel free yeah. to keep asking questions, folks, but I just wanted to make sure that Kim had time to cover the second piece. Yeah, um, and I do um, also want to point out before we move off from move, move away from the um, Pets with, Belong with Families Act um, that Ann English is. Um, there, there's a, an event going on, um, mydogsmyhome.org, um, to um, uh, advocate for the necessity of keeping, you know, um, pets and their owners together, um, particularly when it comes to people experiencing homelessness. Um, so thank you, Anne, for elevating that as well um, as a resource. Um, so the other bill that we were hoping for feedback on um, is the EVs for All Act. Um, which would create um, a joint program between HUD, the Department of Transportation, and the Department of Energy um, to develop a grant program for basically an electric vehicle ride sharing program at public housing agencies. Um, so public housing agencies would be able to apply or nonprofit organizations would be able to apply for up to a million dollars in grant funding to develop a um, electric vehicle ride sharing program at public housing. Um, so tenants would be able to rent electric vehicles, um, take them to, you know, grocery shopping, take their families on, you know, um, drivable vacations, um, st uh, stuff like that. So that's kind of the um, gist of the bill. Um, yeah, happy to answer questions or hear, hear thoughts on that. I think folks are still ruminating on it. Oh, Esther. Okay, let me see. Oh no, you're already in here. You're okay. <laughs> I was gonna yeah. say. Like, <laughs> so, go ahead. <laughs> so I've actually been talking to this um, to my state party um, because I'm on the California Democratic Renters Council, and again, this is like tackling just one tiny portion of a bigger, broader thing. I don't know who's putting these bills together, but they're very. They're almost like designed not to really do much because the idea is great here but the, the the problem is bigger right we have you know everybody's pushing for electric bicycles and electric cars we have failing grid so if everybody got a, an electric vehicle that could afford it 
we would crash it anyway. But in the meantime, people who live as renters, where are they going to plug in a vehicle? You know, if you live in an apartment complex that's 40, 50 years old, how are you going to charge an electric vehicle? You know, those are the, I mean, I think that it, it's, it seems like they need to be a little more thoughtful before they put these bills together to see if they're actually going to achieve anything. I mean, I get it. The idea of, you know, sharing them is great, but are, I mean, are they going to, is this grant money going to be put towards the program or is it going to be put towards the infrastructure for that program? Because anything having to do with electric or, you know, climate change and, and all of these things, they all sound great, but renters don't have a choice in what appliances they pick. The, if they wanted to go green, they don't have a choice. Landlords don't care because they don't pay their individual utility bills, the renters do. So, you know, this is a part of the conversation that goes to rent isn't the only cost that's related to housing. And we should be addressing that portion of it and how we can make that a little bit more feasible for renters. And then also at that point, talk about how the, you know, how the renters utilities could go green. So yeah. I, I, when I saw these bills in the, in the tenant talk, uh, you know, like preview, I was like, oh good, maybe somebody's, you know, they're finally getting around to talking about these things that I've been bringing up for a while, but it's, it, I would be shocked if this goes through with anywhere. Yeah, thanks, Esther. I mean, I don't mean to sound negative, but. No, not at all. And it also, just seems like whoever's putting these bills together. Thinking of. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm not one to. Um, I don't think it, you know, when we're asking for feedback, it's not like only tell us the good things, you know. Uh, so we also, you know, welcome kind of the the realistic and like the, the some of the issues um, with these bills. Um, so for. This bill in particular, it would also provide funding to create those um, electric vehicle charging stations. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's one one piece. Um, I did, uh, um, I know Danielle Walker um, had like a few thoughts written down in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, Danielle, if you wanna come and like unmute yourself, but I'll, I'll allow you to unmute yourself if you'd like to, you're allowed to, but <laughs> no pressure on that. I know you just said, um, hoping to elaborate a little bit more. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, um, I, I happen to live in one of these areas that has very favorable um, real estate. And um, they said that, you know, the housing complex that we've lived in um, has just been dilapidated and needs so much work that it'll be cheaper to tear it down and redevelop the property. So they've given us a timeline, but due to COVID, a lot of things, dates were pushed back. Uh, so now that we're preparing to get ready to leave uh, the area that many of us have lived in for so many years, like, you know, I've been in this area for 40 years. Um, the, the property, this public housing uh, complex has was built in 1940, like the early 40s. So um, at this time, we're being forced to move uh, in other parts of the city that a lot of us, you know, as lifelong residents down here are just frankly not um, familiar with. And a lot of us have young children who, you know, still attend schools in this area. Um, when we had questions if we could still sort of live in the area, um, you know, we were told by public housing authority, housing authority, that uh, they don't have relationships with landlords in our area. So we have to, uh, you know, go elsewhere and assimilate in other areas of the city, which I feel is so unfair. Um, so I was wondering if something could be done along the lines of what you said, Kim, about you know just upping the amount of the vouchers so that we could afford to stay in the area as opposed to, you know, and a lot of us, you know, there, there are very few drivers around here. And so people who, um, live in 
this area, also work in this area, have children who go to school in this area. So um, yeah, I just, I don't know what to do. And, and I've been trying to mobilize residents, but it seems as if everyone is just in such despair and they feel like they don't have a voice. Um, so it's been really hard. You know, people are just sort of accepting defeat and I don't want that to happen. Um, and I feel like, you know, shame on housing authority for waiting so many years and decades to, um, you know, update the, um, the infrastructure. So I, I'm just at a loss and I try to attend these meetings as much as I can. I just was, um, I just switched jobs. I was working in the uh, education sector, but now I am a housing counselor and I'm studying for my, to take the HUD exam and become a certified HUD uh, counselor. But, you know, I just, I want to help because I just see these disparities and I see this, my city, Jersey City becoming so overly gentrified. And it, it's just really unfair for us lifelongers who appreciate and love the city and just want to have, you know, um, a good quality of life. And, and it's just because of our socioeconomic status that we can't have that. So yeah, that that's my spiel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, Danielle. Um, and congratulations on you know your upcoming exam. It sounds like you're doing really incredible things um, for your community and for your neighborhood. Um, and you're absolutely right. It is unfair. It's unfair and it's grotesque that you know um, people who have lived in in these areas for generations are getting kicked out um, and forced to relocate and to move into areas that they don't know and disconnect from communities and the places that they work and the you know places their kids go to school. Um, uh, I just really want to I validate that. That's absolutely unfair. Um, yeah, it, I, and I wish, um, you know, I wish I, I, I'm so sorry to hear that. And I wish that I could, you know, provide a silver bullet solution that would um, fix all of it. And that I could tell HUD, you know, these are the things that you need to do and do them right now in order to stop this. Um, and all we can do is keep, you know, pushing, um, and keep trying and keep organizing, um, because it's, you know, there's not a, there's not a lot else. I'm sorry. I know. I'm sorry. Um, I, I laugh because I'm sad <laughs> and, uh, um, it, it's hard when it feels like there's nothing to, um, offer, I guess. Um, sorry, go ahead. I saw you on mute. Um, Sid, and I, I see that Joey is on too. Um, I wonder if there's any kind of um, organizing strategies or anything that you've seen um, as field organizers that have, that have helped in situations like Danielle's. Well, I think uh, gentrification is a troublesome issue everywhere. Um, and I think we've really explored a lot of issues that help people uh, in neighborhoods deal with that. Uh, I'd call your attention to an issue of tenant talk that we did specifically on gentrification about two years ago, in which we outlined things including uh, community land banking, uh, community benefits agreements, um, tenant opportunities to purchase and uh, rent control as many things that provide housing stability. Um, but I don't want the conversation to kind of uh, get off our agenda topic, which is uh, the electric cars proposal. I'm wondering if anybody else uh, on the call has feedback uh, about the bill that uh, that Kim was, was talking about that's being proposed in Congress right now, uh, because members of Congress at this point really are uh, relying on feedback uh, about uh, kind of where to move on this proposal. And we are relying on you um, to help us understand uh, what our position should be. Yes, and I see um, a couple of folks with their hands raised. So I see, I think Betty was the first one to raise their hand. So I'll go ahead and allow her to talk first. Um, Betty, if you want to go ahead and then we'll go ahead and go with um, Shanice. Betty, if you're there, you can go ahead. Okay, I'll allow I'll allow Shanice <laughs> to go ahead. Shanice, if you want to go. Hi. Yes, I just wanted to um, make a suggestion to Ms. Danielle. 
Um, I would encourage you to have a conversation with your city council. I don't know if you have already crossed that bridge, but ideally you would hope that your city council will have a relationship and a rapport with the housing authority. And I'm sure that there's some plan in place um, that they have uh, developed or if not vetted um, across the city, especially with the council itself. So again, I would encourage you to have a conversation with the, the council. And if too, if it takes you to organize and, and um, galvanize individuals from that community to see if in fact that you can hold your elected officials in the administration for that matter accountable and seeing if you can get some further assistance. Uh, can I, speak? I, I would like to respond to that. Thank you, Shanice. Um, so I, I spoke at a few of the city council meetings that, um, you know, had this on the agenda. And it seems as if um, the city council members um, are very aligned with the mayor. We only have about one uh, solid person that was willing to help us um, strategize and, and advocate for more transparency. Um, we were told that an RFP was put out. So the, the, a quick, some context, a quick um, history. There was many housing authority complexes in the city and they started to become privatized. And um, we noticed that a lot of the residents from those other housing authorities ended up coming down to where we were because they weren't given the right to return back. So we did work with an organization that helped us uh, frame that we wanted the right to return once the property was re redeveloped. Uh, they did pass um, that, I think, um, and said that we would be able to do so. But um, in the interim, we were just a little afraid of where we had to go while the uh, property was being redeveloped. And we noticed that there was sort of a trend where there were many residents from other public housing complexes that had to end up living where we now are um, because they had no other place to go. So um, so we had asked if we could have more representation resident-wise on the RFP committee and uh, housing authority told us no, that, they, um, that the majority uh, are housing authority employees. Um, so they, they felt, they stood very strong on that. Um, because we just figured if we had more of a, a transparent process with the RFP, um, we would be able to have some input and vote accordingly. So it, it's just, um, yeah, I don't know. I just feel as if we have so the least power. Ms. Dayal, so I will pull them to the carpet and I will actually pose the question because if in fact they're receiving federal funds and the professionals on the line, they can probably speak to this more, um, more than I can. In terms of if they're receiving federal funds, there is a clause in which they have to participate. They have to adhere to citizen participation. So they can't just exclude the public or the residents outside of that process. So I will literally bring that to their attention. I will work with some of the professionals from NL NLIHC to see if in fact if you can get some of the the language and really pull the regulations from HUD to say in fact that they have to adhere to a level of citizen participation. Thank you. So Ms. Beverly put it in the um in the chat. Okay. Yes. I'm grateful y'all have each other to Thank help you. each other. Thank out. you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Of course. Of course. Um, and really quickly too, um, I just want to get back um, to the question. I think Kim, you already answered it by chance, but just the cost of the electric charging stations, just so everybody can know the answer in case they're not seeing the screen. Um, so that was a question that was posed in the Q and A, uh, and I'm not sure how much, like you know, an, uh, an individual electric charging station um, would cost to um, put up, but the grants would distribute up to a million dollars to um, cover the cost of, um, you know, building those electric stations, um, providing cars, maintenance to those cars, um, all, all, all of those, all of those um, fees be covered within that, you know, million dollar grant. Awesome, thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody who contributed to um, and helped out Danielle. Um, Danielle, there's some folks um, in the chat that are offering help as well, offering their phone number. So if you 
want to be able to contact those folks, feel free to reach out to them, but I can also just email you this information afterwards if that works as well. Um, awesome, okay. And then um, my I had a question too that was um, kind of similar to what a lot of people were asking, but just like making sure um, that they're like investments um, in the maintenance and the cars are kept up as, and maintained because as we know, like in um, public housing, there are a lot of repairs that need to be made to the housing itself. So just making sure that the cars are treated the same um, if the bill were to pass. Um, not the same as like being <laughs> like in poor conditions, but just making sure that we're investing in the repair. <laughs> Yeah, all of that um, grant money would go towards, you know, maintain maintenance for um, the cars and um, repairs and, and all of that good stuff. Um, I will say, um, you know, I don't know the, the based on how the bill is written. It does it leaves a lot of room for what happens after that million dollars. You know what happens after that grant is spent um where does the money come from to upkeep the program in the long term um and i don't think that that is adequately addressed in in the bill text um so uh you know there's the million dollar grant which is all well and good and then what happens to maintain um the program and the upkeep and all of that um, and I will say too, um, thank you so much, Danielle, for sharing your story. And thank you to everybody who um, has, you know, reached out to provide um, help and, you know, um, assistance. It's just um, really um, beautiful and really inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, it's very inspiring. And, um, you know, I, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, we love to see it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I really, I really like seeing the community too. It's, it's really inspiring. Um, happy that we can create the space for y'all. <laughs> um, and then just one last question from Esther Kim, and then I'll just close up with some last comments. Oh, I put it in the chat. You guys answered it already. If it was about, oh, okay. I, I was curious about the vehicles. Um, but I, I also put in the chat. I, I have, I sit on the board of a nonprofit that has um, a pro program that we've created to incentivize landlords to take more vouchers. So if you guys want to talk about that yeah. offline, we can. Yeah, I can. Let me write that down now because I know that that's going to be <laughs> something. Let's see. So, okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Esther. Um, okay. So really quickly, I just have a few updates for you all. Um, before we hop off today. Um, firstly, I want to thank him for joining us um, and going over those two pieces of legislation. Um, and thank you to everybody who participated and shared their stories um, and all of you who are attending here today. And as I noted, being very helpful um, to Danielle, I'm sure she really appreciates it. Um, and I'm like a big believer in including folks with lived expertise in this process. So thank you for joining today. Um, and in the spirit of feedback, um, I do highly encourage all of you to send me an email if you'd like, um, just with some ideas and topics that you'd like to see for future Tenant Talk Lives. I know Esther just shared one right now, but if you'd like to see anything at all, um, this is really tailored to what you would all like to see. And I want to make sure that we're addressing concerns that, um, that you are all experiencing. So. Um, Danielle, if that's um, something that a lot of folks are experiencing, like please let us know and we can go ahead and try to figure out something similar to that. And then lastly, um, I do want to share a snippet um, from our upcoming Tenant Talk, which is a publication um, tailored to um, low-income renters and tenants, such as some of y'all on this call. And it, it looks really good. I'm really excited for it. Um, this is from our editorial board. Just like a quick little snippet, it includes the editorial board letter that will be going out um, in this upcoming edition of Tenant Talk, which will be released hopefully later this month. Um, and if you are interested in signing up for a paper copy of Tenant Talk, you can also do so um, at the link that I just dropped in the chat. We're really excited for this. Um, 
we've had a lot of awesome folks working on it. And I think to this day, it's probably the most um, external authors that we've had featured on a tenant talk. So we're really excited to have um, a strong community voice within the tenant talk. Um, but yeah. Um, I Can I just ask a question real quick? I raised my hand, but it's uh, okay. it's about this. Um, yeah. Are those publications separate than the annual? I I pay. Um, I'm a member, and they mm -hmm. send like annually something. Is this a separate one from what we get, or do we have to request it separately, or what? Yeah, I would request it separately just because we have a lot of different publications that get um, sent out. Um, and usually we have like a system of like filtering through if there are duplicates. So um, okay, thanks. if you request it more than once, like it won't be <laughs> hazardous or harmful to you, I guess. So okay, feel thanks. Free to fill it out. of course, yeah. And to folks who have filled out that form before, feel free to fill it out again if you want a different number of tenant talks or if you have an address change. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Um, and we'll see you. Um, I believe it's going to be March 7th again. Yeah, so another 7th. <laughs> See you next month, everybody. Have a good night.